Okay, so welcome to part eight in this series, People Are Complicated. We're in 1 Samuel 24, but we've, we've made a big jump. We're not covering every part of the story. It's, yeah, I know. It's very disappointing. <laughs> but it, it would take a couple of years, I feel like. <clears throat> so we've fast-forwarded 1 Samuel 24, a scene that seems like it's made for a movie, um, PG. 13. Uh, I'm going to read the text out loud, and then I'll ask you what stands out to you, what you notice, what, what questions does the text raise for you. So three scenes in a cave. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel, and went to look for David and his men in the direction of the rocks and the wild goats. He came to the sheepfolds beside the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. The men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, I will give your enemy into your hand. And you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David went and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's cloak. Afterward, David was stricken to the heart because he had cut off a corner of Saul's cloak. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to raise my hand against him. <clears throat> for he is the Lord's anointed. So David rebuked his men severely and did not permit them to attack Saul. Then Saul got up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also rose up and went out of the cave and called after Saul, my Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and did obeisance. David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of those who say, David seeks to do you harm? This very day, your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you into my hand in the cave. And some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not raise my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, the corner of your cloak in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your cloak and did not kill you, you may know for certain that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. <clears throat> I've not sinned against you, though you are hunting me to take my life. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the ancient proverb says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness. But my hand shall not be against you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A single flea? May the Lord, therefore, be judged and give sentence between me and you. May he see to it and plead my cause and vindicate me against you. When David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son, David? Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. Today you've explained how you've dealt with me and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me in your hands. For who has ever found an enemy and sent the enemy away safely? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. Now I know that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my descendants after me, and that you will not wipe out my name from my father's house. So David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to, do, to the stronghold. Okay, what do you notice? What stands out to you? What questions does the text raise? Uh, 
But this is all. I, I just want to say it's a, it's a great example of character. I mean, it should be commended and it should be remembered and we should follow it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty Good to hear. Pretty rare, pretty inspiring. I thought it was an interesting contrast with the story of um, Abraham and Sarah who were waiting on God's promise and took matters into their own hands, mm. you know, and, you know, Sarah gave Abraham her maidservant to sleep with and they had Ishmael. So, you know, God had made a promise to him and they said, we're tired of waiting. We're going to do it this way. We're here. David is, seems to be saying, you know, he's going to wait on God, you know, to fulfill this. He's not taking matters into his own hand. He's going to put his faith and his trust in God. That's very Just, good. Yeah. It's a good. No, it is. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I, I, you know that just what entered my mind. <laughs> In that vein, though, in verse 10, you get still this God's will and all this. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's mixed messy. And because so in the one verse, it says, David saying this, the Lord gave you into my hands, and yet you are the Lord's anointed. It's like, well, you know, you're, it's just kind of a strange thing that, you know, mm -hmm. the Lord is giving you into my hands, but yet I won't touch you because you're the Lord's anointed. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like those two things are opposite of each other yeah yeah and and clearly when david's men say something similar yeah that they mean yeah he's mm -hmm. god has brought this man to you so you can kill him mm -hmm. or so we can kill him mm -hmm. yeah i like the touches of humor in, in the story <laughs> yeah <coughs> Seems like David's willing to wait on God's plan. Let yeah. it play. Yeah. yeah. Even though it would have been pretty convenient <laughs> to solve that problem, he didn't do it. Yeah. Some points of tension uh, that I noticed, you know, uh, there's 3,000 men on, on, on the attack just, just to get David and his men. Mm -hmm. I assume David does not have 3,000 men hiding in a cave mm -hmm. there, but just the, you know, the tension between the, the um, sort of exaggerated response mm -hmm. from Saul. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the contrast, so this is on page 37, 30, the, the back page here, 37. The contrast between what David's men believed the Lord wanted and what David believed the Lord wanted and maybe even with Saul. So, you know, discerning the will of God is it gets raised here in messy ways. Contrast between David refusing to take Saul with his own hands and, and yet seemingly calling on God to do, do the very thing. You know, repeatedly, David says, may, may the Lord avenge me mm -hmm. against you. And so it's just interesting. I'm not going to do anything, but I am praying that God will. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, David calls Saul father in verse 11. Saul calls David son in verse 16. So it's just interesting language of intimacy here. Um, and, and Saul's ongoing pursuit of David versus the, his conclusion at the end that David is to be king. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we, we might hope here that this is the resolution of everything. Of course, it's not. Um, and, and it's then one other thing there, just, you know, big picture. The narrative hinges on the power of a nonviolent response to violence. And so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, echoes of that as we think about like the civil rights movement and um, other historical examples of responding to violence in nonviolent ways. Well, this is certainly an example of loving your enemy. Yeah, yeah. Very good one, yeah. Yeah, and that kind of integrity really stands out. I mean. Some uh, some general commentary. Uh, so we, we might just note here that, that several scholars believe that this account and one recorded in 1 Samuel 26, which seems you know very similar, several scholars believe that that's one event 
that's been woven into the story twice. You know, in the Gospels, we have the, the, the cleansing of the temple that that seems to happen twice. And so, you know, we're left wondering, was that was that one story, one event that like John is sort of using differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? It could be the same thing here. Um, Walt, Walter Brueggemann notes, the narrative reports the slow, steady working out of God's purpose. David need not hurry that process like Abraham and Sarah even as he need not doubt it. Saul cannot thwart the resolve of God. David is a man on the way to power, ordained by God. <laughs> Eugene Peterson uh, draws into the wilderness theme here. So the story of David in the wilderness of En Gedi is bracketed by two other wilderness stories. On the one side is the 40 years that Moses led the Israelites through the Sinai wilderness. On the other, the 40 days that Jesus fasted in the Judean wilderness. Three great wilderness stories in our scriptures, each influencing the others. In the Moses wilderness story, the people of Israel were trained to discern between idols and the living God, taught to worship. Through their wilderness experience, they were prepared to live totally before God. In the Jesus wilderness story, our Lord learned to discern between religion that uses God and spirituality that enters into what God does. And he was thereby prepared to be our savior, not merely our helper or advisor or entertainer. In the David wilderness story, we see a young man hated and hunted like an animal. <clears throat> His very humanity profane, forced to decide between a life of blasphemy and a life of prayer and choosing prayer. In choosing prayer, he entered into the practice of holiness. And then one more line there from uh, Peterson. Fifteen stories are told out of David's wilderness years. And we're, we're not touching on all of them. But uh, the meeting of David and Saul in the wilderness cave near and Gedi is one of those early wilderness stories. So question, can you think of a wilderness time in your own life and how did God use that wilderness time? Yeah, I am. I mean, but I, I would say, you know, any any um, any difficult situation would be a wilderness story, at least for me. And wilderness stories normally um, uh, allow you to grow, and usually you're the, you you benefit not at the time, but you benefit from the wilderness. And so it's hard to say that you need to be thankful for that, but ultimately it it, it enriches your life. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you, Art. I, I just building on that, I, I've had plenty of them, and I would call them in between times. Oh, okay, yeah, in times, yeah. It's kind of like into the woods. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. woods are really wilderness for them. It's a lot of the same themes show up. In right. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cave scene number one, verses one through seven. Walter Brueggemann notes in the brief narr narrative of verses one through seven, Saul is completely passive. He neither says anything or does anything, except to use a restroom. <laughs> the conversation is between David and David's men. So that's, that's where our, our focus should go. Robert Bergen. Um, Saul returns to Gibeah to focus on David. When his intelligence network informed him of David's whereabouts, he immediately assembled an elite fighting force from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men. Having made a journey of more than 30 miles, the royal troops centered their efforts in the vicinity of the crags of the wild goats, otherwise unidentified rock outcropping near the Dead Sea. As the troops made their way down a path cut by shepherds driving their flocks, 
they came to a series of sheep pens along the way, suggesting a favorable campsite for Saul's men and a nearby cave. There Saul went in to relieve himself, literally to cover his feet, um, apparently a, um, you know, a, a metaphor for uh, using the bathroom and then covering it up, okay, to cover his feet. Providentially, the cave that Saul chose to use was the same one in which David and his men were hiding. Saul's vulnerability during this private moment was extreme, and David's soldiers knew it. In fact, the situation was so extraordinary that David's men concluded God made it happen to fulfill the prophetic words, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. <laughs> this prophecy is not mentioned elsewhere in Scripture and probably represents an example of false prophecy. Alternatively, it may have been a genuine prophecy related to non-Israelite enemies misapplied to Paul. Uh, so let's let's start there with that strange uh, prophetic word here sort of used uh, by David's men to explain the situation and and ultimately to um, you know a, as a license to kill. So th there's a mis misspelling here in letter C. David's men David's men apparently use something that's not scripture. I will give your enemies in your hands for you to deal with as you wish. So they, they apparently use something that's not scripture as scripture in order to give permission for themselves to mistreat Saul. And, and even if it is scripture, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. It's still being marshaled uh, to permit the men to kill Saul. So it's, it's, it's just, the, it's an interesting moment where something scriptural or near scriptural is is being trotted out to say god has uh, given us the green light here to do something violent and take this man's life uh, so what scriptures or phrases thought to be scriptures are used in similar ways today american slavery um, the example i thought of the and i mean I, and it was scripture I mean, they had the scripture to prove that slavery was legitimate. Mm. They just didn't have the spirit of Christ. Mm. Um, but th they were really quite convinced by the way he ordinarily used scripture. But they were on the side of righteousness. Mm. They were on the side of violence. They were on the side of exploiting, mm. um, torturing mm. Um, people. Yeah. Yeah, what, a, what an egregious historical example. And apartheid falls in the same category. Well, certainly, you know, women have been, mm, scriptures, okay. you know, have been used to keep them quiet. It's only been a recent years that any blessing of that patriarchal system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, spare the rod, spoil the child. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's certainly verses, you know, yeah. that, that talk about disciplining, but I think they're used to harm children mm -hmm. and cause trauma. And, mm -hmm. I would say a lot of prosperity gospel do talk about, like, you know, the more you give, the more you will receive, just with that yeah. ideology, even though it is true and God does promise to open floodgates. Yeah. It's just not the way it's interpreted is like, oh, it will definitely happen. So yeah. you got to, you know, just keep mm -hmm. giving, 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 giving. Yeah. And where God, it's actually, you know, in the scripture, it's very clearly said, like, hey, if you don't take care of your own family, you're worse than that. You know, like those scriptures are not. Like taken into account, or, yeah. there's a lot of problems about wisdom in finances and yeah. managing the money and stuff. So. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, it's great to be sacrificial, but you know, it's not taken that way. Well, in all these examples, you've got a person in power taking advantage right. of other people, right. yeah. right. taking all the money, you know, mm -hmm. treating them like yeah. property, treating women like property, even children. 
I mean, it's just that person in power mm -hmm. taking advantage. So it's the one who's speaking this truth <laughs> is one that's actually profiting. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. so many others to it. Look who benefits it. I mean, David's men are quoting it to David, but who do they think is going to benefit from this? Their mm -hmm. God, them and their God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Them because they're following their God. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're eager to get on with this, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> yeah. We're living in a cave. <laughs> yeah, we get to go home. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's let's reflect on on David's action of, of cutting off the corner of the rope. So this is the bottom of page 38, Robert Bergen. He cut off a, a corner of Saul's robe. This act was far from meaningless because David's confiscation of a portion of the royal robe signified the transfer of power from the house of Saul to the house of David. Furthermore, by removing the corner of the robe, David made Saul's robe to be in non-compliance with Torah requirements. We'll read Numbers 15 in a moment. Thus, <clears throat> Saul's most obvious symbol of kingship was made unwearable. In essence, David had symbolically invalidated Saul's claim kingship. Here's uh, Numbers 15 at the top of page 39. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them to make fringes on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to put a blue cord on the fringe at each corner. You have the fringe so that when you see it, you will remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and not follow the lust of your own heart and your own eyes. So the, the corners of the garments, the corners of the robes were actually pretty important um pedagogically right they, they they were there to teach a regular visual to the mm -hmm. commandment of god uh then brueggemann picks this up uh, as gunn another author as gunn observed this gesture cutting off the corner of the road is richly nuanced capable of several different readings first the piece of the robe is evidence that saul was indeed at the disposal of David, and David refused to dispose of Saul. David has spared the king's life. Second, the double use of cut off suggests an act which would have terminated Saul, Saul's future, and Saul's heir. <coughs> the same verb cut off is used three times by Jonathan in his passionate plea for David's steadfastness. Third, Gunn suggests that to cut off the skirt is a playful euphemism for cutting off the penis and so rendering Saul helpless, void of manhood and bereft of a future. That's the only PG-13 reference tonight. <laughs> um, and then he concludes by avoiding Saul's claim to kingship, he was at some level lifting his hand against the anointing of the Lord. This was more than an act against the king, it was rebellion against the Lord, who had commanded Israel Israelites not to curse their rulers. And I have to be honest, I've never thought about this uh, before. You know, I just, to me, it was just sort of like, um, I'm, I'm going to get what's closest here, and it's the corner of this road here. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what seems significant to you, uh, after all that, about David cutting off the corner of Saul's road? <laughs> well, the connection that seems most obvious is that he real to me is is the is the one that relates back to the other passage we read about the cords and the fringe and so forth and so i see that some of these other they kind of make they seem to make leaps yeah of connections i'm like well how did you make that leap on what basis are you making that leap and i know we're just getting a quote so maybe it's been dealt with more in, in mm -hmm. that but just that the reading of it feels like mm -hmm. that's a bit of a leap there I mean, it, and that's exactly it, what I thought. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it shows it shows a it shows a matured monarchy that has all these rituals set up. And to, this is first kings. You're mm -hmm. they're doing it on the run. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, making it up as they go. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm not sure about the commentator. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I buy the 
I mean, I'm not sure the Deuteronomy one because people didn't follow the rules that much. Right. So, so, but to me, it is the euphemism of cut off and and all the things that that sounds more like Hebrew storytelling to me. Mm. Is the the euphemism, and we've already seen that they use a euphemism in the text, right? About about covering his feet, right? Mm. That's literally what it says because they do use that kind of euphemism. So that thing that talks about worried about your feet is a sign of, you know, is, is the uh, alert to anybody that's familiar with, you know, the type of storytelling that starts, the way it goes in, in you know, in time of Moses when it's talking about circumcision and literally they don't talk about circumcision, they talk about feet and all this stuff. So it's a, it, to me, it's just the uh, epitome of vulnerability yeah. that has consequences for you and your generation and all this stuff. Um, and and to cut off a corner, I'm not sure if it's just the closest little thing, you know, that he could that he he reached, or the the most innocuous thing to say, I was close, I could have done this to you, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And and in a way, that's sort of humiliating, but in a way, it's not. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, what is this? This, is this. And I think that's maybe to me that was what my first inclination when reading it this time, which isn't the same every time, but was you know, I think. It was David might consider that he, in some sense, humiliated Saul in a way that, in the way he spared his life, mm -hmm. he did kind of reach out and humiliate him a little bit in front of his men, his, you know, Saul's men, everybody. Right. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, because David then does have this. Yeah, this moment. Your response where we're oh gosh, what have yeah. I done? What have I done? Yeah. What have I done? Which, you know, anyway, that was my thought. And and to the Hebrew telling the story um, comment there. I mean, at, at, in the third scene, Saul does plead with David, don't cut off my descendants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so th there's, a, there's, some, there's a connection there mm -hmm. and sort of some uh, telegraphing right. where David cuts off, cuts off, cuts off, and mm -hmm. Saul at the end says, oh, don't please don't, don't cut off yeah. mm -hmm. my descendants. I, I, I want to say that uh, it's going to sound gross, but he must have been enjoying his poop so much. You, know? <laughs> yeah, you wonder why and so he did it was, and he didn't even know. Yeah. You know, to me, that is just uh, you know, Harry uh Carpenter years ago ran out and he said, Oh, I, I enjoyed my poop. Mm -hmm. And uh <laughs> we adults he was like what he was five years old. Like, <laughs> we adults started laughing, and all of us said, How many of us have ever wanted to walk out of the bathroom saying, Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it, it'd be interesting to see this done on the Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the poop, the poop song. Uh, <laughs> Without that. Yes, uh, brings, brings back to something good, Julie. You know, I was going to say, it is really hard to imagine that you could get that close to someone. Yeah. To cut off a piece of their clothing with them not knowing you were there, <clears throat> you know, it's it's just so intimate in a way that how drunk is he? <laughs> I mean, he's, he does seem well, he does seem unstable, right? I mean, he's right. he's been unstable for quite some time. It's so okay. well, and that's what I was thinking. Yeah. He's not very unstable because he's been in cave for a while, but mm -hmm. he's not really sure. Right, so he's that's a good point. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for some. Another one is what if he took off his robe? Well, was, oh, yeah, okay, there we go. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And that would totally make sense too, because you don't want a, a, a robe hanging down. <laughs> no, just like you got to be careful with skirts and stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can see David handing him something to wipe with. <laughs> Right. Okay, so uh, given that we've rejected most of what the interpreters <laughs> said there, I'll move on. Uh, okay, letter I, Brueggemann. As the narrative presents it, however, David's loyal heart prevails. David is the one to be after Yahweh's own heart. 
Now his sensitive, obedient heart is smitten. He regrets this act against Saul and refuses to go further. So what, what do you learn about David's heart in this narrative? What, what do you think we're supposed to see when it comes to David's heart here? I think that's why God loved him. Mm -hmm. He is capable of looking at his action mm -hmm. and um, and able to reflect on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, self-awareness. And Saul is incapable of oh, mm -hmm. that. Like he's gone. Yeah, that's a really good time. Mm -hmm. There's some, you know, interesting. It's striking to me how quickly that happens for David. Mm -hmm. um, takes me quite a while to be that self-aware. <laughs> Usually somebody has to come to me. But, yeah. David so quickly has um, genuine concern about what he just did. The clothes, clothes are very important symbols of who you are and your power and everything. I mean, you know, when somebody is in mourning, they rip their clothes. I mean, it's yeah. it's all they have. You know, they don't have like all the other symbols that that we have. You know. And to cut off something that is so ceremonially representative mm -hmm. of someone's, you know, power or whatever, um, he was, he was, he shamed Saul, mm -hmm. you know, by having a piece of clothes because it, it wasn't a four corner mm -hmm. garment anymore. There was something wrong with it. There was, some, it was, it was um, um, deformed, basically, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and uh just completely you know I embarrassing mm -hmm. and in some circles that's that's worse than like murdering mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. and and it's it's it you know in some circles you can you can see i'd rather you kill me than shame me i mean that's yeah. why people kill themselves if they're captured or whatever yeah because they can't take yeah. the the shame of being captured and living to 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 see the ridicule yeah which that yeah that's that's a really good insight because i mean I think largely we can say this is a sort of honor shame based culture mm -hmm. and so that would carry a lot more weight than if it would in some like western american mm -hmm. contemporary culture yeah yeah oh gosh i need to buy a new rope um okay i'm gonna i'm gonna skip that last question uh, although i think it's it's you know it's one of the big questions to think about when have you responded to violence with nonviolence? Um, but let's let's move on to cave scene number two, eight verses eight through fifteen. <laughs> so Robert Bergen, the section of text stretching over verses eight through twenty-one contains the longest recorded quotes by both David, one hundred and fourteen Hebrew words, and Saul, sixty-seven Hebrew words, found for Samuel. Um, in, in fact, it's it's uh, uh, the longest the longest speech given by Saul anywhere. Uh, the, the amount of space the author devoted to these two quotations suggests that he considered them to be thematically central. Close inspection of these quotations does not disappoint us, for they are seen to contain at least two major items. David's most passionate affirmation of loyalty to the king and Saul's confession that David would be Israel's next king. So what the author wants us to do is pay attention to the speeches. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip... Uh, that qu next question, what are some contemporary speeches that have been significant to you? But again, this literature is focusing on the power of, of, of the speech, power of the speech. So, um, Walter Bergen, bottom of that page, David speaks first. His is a self-serving speech intended to show the innocence and graciousness of David. The speech intends to put David in the right and therefore inevitably to put Saul in the wrong. David uses explicitly juridical language. He wants to be vindicated and acquitted in the eyes of Saul, or at least in the eyes of, of listening Israel, and asks Saul to uh, consider carefully the evidence, the kind of evidence proper to a court of law. Robert Bergen, rather than cursing his ruler, David honored him by calling him both my lord and the king. Rather than falling upon Saul in a murderous attack, David fell upon the ground. 
and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Following these verbal and actual signals of loyalty to the king, David uttered what is perhaps the most passionate and eloquent plea for reconciliation between two persons recorded in all ancient literature. And then uh, first he discussed the eyewitness evidence. David carefully walked Saul through the immediate past events, supplying details to emphasize the extreme danger from which the king was delivered. Second, David presented material evidence, literally, to support the interpretation of events just given a piece of your robe in my hand. If there was any doubt in Saul's mind about how close his brush with death really was, this evidence would remove it. And finally, David led Saul to the desired verdict. He was not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. So what, what stands out to you about David's speech? And, and you know, if you want to just look back over 8 to 15 there, what do you find interesting about David's speech? I think we have to keep in mind what David was facing. Right, Saul and his three thousand elite warriors coming to get him. Mm. I mean, he, you know, he he needed to make his case in order to survive. Mm. Yeah, yeah, this is a dire situation for David. Yeah. Chris, I was going to say it's interesting. Oh, it's filled with... What's that, Julie? I was going to say it's interesting. That's filled with both, you know, considerable humility and a lot of confidence. <laughs> And uh, yeah. he, he really believes God's plan is. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, Laconia and then uh, Elaine. For me, this has got sh shades of Tamar and Judah. Hmm. Uh, you know, she was pregnant and he had impregnated her. She was a prostitute mm -hmm. and he just uh, sent her away. Mm -hmm. And she said, here is the, the belt mm -hmm. of the man. And he was he was caught, mm -hmm. and David was. I mean, Saul was caught. Mm -hmm. uh, I never thought about mm -hmm. Lamar and Judah before, but yeah, uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Elaine, well, I was just going to say, it seems like David is expressing something that he would be expected to say to a king mm -hmm. that the king. He's doing it it's sort of, well, just as in the coronation of King Charles in England, people bow because that's what's expected of mm. them. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, so when you say that, it makes me think that David's trying to speak and act in a way that Saul would would, would uh, understand and yeah be moved understand by. and would like yeah would approve of yeah that's good that's really insightful yeah yeah well when you think about as you kind of back up a little bit and think about how um this is the first king of israel and if the first king of israel was overthrown by violence mm -hmm. then I mean, to, to me, this is a long reason why we've had every reason to, you know, every opportunity or things to be overthrown by violence. And this is showing you that the king of Israel should not be overthrown by violence, sort of thing. You know, and so it's a really long explanation. Otherwise, somebody could just say, well, God talked to me and say, you know, he, he anointed me. You didn't, you weren't there. You didn't say it, but God anointed me. And here I take over and, you know. This is sort of a, a, a break on that. Even though somebody else out of the line is going to take over, Jonathan approves, you know, there's all this okay about it. You know, there's yeah. all this um, working it out, mm -hmm. an extended working it out. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. The, the first succession yeah. has to be handled very carefully. Yes. Yes. The same because precedent. The precedent. Later. Yeah. Yeah. Later, it's going to go off the rails. But, you know, please. Yeah. Let's get this first one right. <laughs> Let's work on the beginning. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Let's uh, let's do cave scene three, verses sixteen through twenty-two. Saul lifted up his voice and wept. This is the middle of page forty. He weeps now because he must face what he has long known. 
He weeps because he must now confront the truth he has avoided. In the moment of confronting the reality of David, Saul must face the truth of his own life. No wonder he must cry, for he must acknowledge not only that David will win and that he will lose, but that his whole effort to be faithful, effective, and powerful, and even righteous has failed. In verse 20, Saul utters the words for which the narrator has been waiting. I know. In 2317, Jonathan had reported to David, Saul, my father, also knows this. But we have only Jonathan's word for it. Now we have the conclusion in Saul's own mouth. We have known all along about David's certain triumph. The narrator and Jonathan have known. The commonly shared knowledge about David's future means nothing unless Saul knows. Finally, in a desperate instant of truth, Saul says, you shall be king. The clause in Hebrew has an infinitive absolute parenthesis. Being king, you shall be king. Genius. And should be rendered, you shall indeed be king. Saul now is the last one to authorize David. Saul knows nothing can stop the coming rule of David. Bergen, letter C, the king launched into the longest unbroken quote credited to him in scripture. 67 Hebrew words. He began by exonerating David, noting that the young man was more righteous than himself, whereas David treated Saul well, that is, in an ethically commendable manner, Saul had treated David badly, that is, wickedly. He affirmed God's royal intentions for the younger man, you will surely be king. In making this confession, Saul confirmed the words of his son, Jonathan. Saul was emotionally crushed by the circumstances, and in this state, set aside all the pretense of superiority to David, begging him to grant two requests. He first asked that his successor not cut off my seed. That is, that David not follow the ancient Near Eastern custom of exterminating all descendants of his, of his dynastic predecessor. And second, he requested that David not wipe out my name from my father's family. A request closely related to the first, but emphasizing the preservation of a link between Saul and his forebearers. Without hesitation, David gave his oath to Saul. David would later fulfill this commitment by giving sanctuary, indeed a position of honor and generous inheritance, to Mephibosheth, St. Samuel 9. Uh, so what stands out to you about Saul's speech? Verses eight, uh, 16 through 22 here. He takes it well. Um, David's speech, he does speak it well. He responds also in humility, not in anger. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't say, like, I'm coming after you now. You know, he doesn't. I mean, if he wanted to, he could have killed David right there. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't. You know, he rather acknowledges, like, wow, you know, you spared me. So, uh, I mean, I know he, he clearly says, like, I, you are more righteous than I am. Because he knows that he wouldn't have done the same. Yeah. So it's good. It's the only part I know that he showed humility since, mm -hmm. you know, the whole situation happened when he opened a monument in his own honor to yeah. now. It's the first time I've seen him yeah. really be that humble and be like, wow, mm -hmm. you know, I have gone far. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're sort of unprepared for that, right? Yeah. I mean, this is not the speech we anticipate. No. And yet it's not the end of the story. Right. <laughs> yeah. We have to go back to warring and yeah. chasing and yeah, because after hearing the unexpected speech, we'd like to see the credits roll and yeah. and think, what a great ending. Mm -hmm. But he'll just say, okay, here's the crown. Okay. <laughs> Your turn. Yeah. But that's it. it reminds me of uh, people who are who fight the knowledge that they're dying. Mm -hmm. And then one day they wake up and they go, I know. Oh, wow. Well, mm -hmm. And I think that's. I think this is a David, uh, a Saul moment where he knows the end is coming. He seems to go in and out of clarity and insanity or something, you know, yes. in and out, you know, because you've got when Jonathan confronts him when he says, you know, which we read about last week, and he was like, yeah, you're right, I'm wrong. He's not trying to trying to get me you know he like believes him and then he goes crazy again and it's just that kind of thing yeah, yeah. it's a moment of clarity yeah which like he loses he loses 
But that's kind of true sometimes, you know. You have a conversation with somebody and they agree, yeah. and you think, well, that was good, that was good. And the next day they wake up and they decide, I'm just gonna ignore that conversation because I don't right. really, I don't feel like going there today. And so I'm just gonna ignore it. Mm -hmm. Okay, two closing uh, questions to uh, reflect on during the week from uh, Vince's book uh, that, that uh, is written around Lexio Divina. So back to page 41, in what ways does this narrative of David suggest an alternative to the way of violence and arms and solving conflicts? What insights from this account might apply to conflicts between people today? And then going back to the issue of discernment, what area of my life is in need of discernment, the Lord's will? How can I make the decisions I need in order to move more confidently into the future? So we'll uh, end with that. Thank you, everybody, for lots of insightful sharing tonight. Good to see everybody. Good to see everyone. Be well.